Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, The Only Way to Go, from RaySteadman.org. The text for this message is from Ecclesiastes 9.11 through 10.15. Now let's turn to one of those Old Testament books they were singing about. Back to the book of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. And we've come now this morning in our study to chapter 9. We'll begin with verse 11. Koheleth means the, the assembler, the one who gathers together. And as we've already seen, King Solomon was put in a unique situation which he could explore and search out and gather together all the various philosophies of life assemble them, examine them, and see which one works. All of you, I'm sure, have seen at one time or another the, a plaque on a wall that says in a very uh, strong German accent, We grow too soon old and too late smart. <laughs> and that, rec- that represents a very eloquent expression of the conclusion many people come to in this living life, that uh, age increases faster than wisdom does. By the time you learn what you need to know, it's already too late to use it. Many people feel that way. The older you grow, the more you have a, a sympathy with that expression. But in this book, we learn that uh, though that is a common experience of life, it's not a necessary one. That it's possible to learn wisdom before it's too late. And it will guide you through life. Now, it won't avoid all the hurt and pain of life. That's where a lot of people make a mistake. They think it's going to deliver them from all pressure and struggle, but it won't. Because as we learn in this book, struggle and pain and pressure and sorrow are all a learning part of the learning process. But what it will do to discover the wisdom of God and to obey it is that your life will not be rendered bitter by the pain and slipping off into depression. You won't find your life ravaged and torn apart and all your dreams collapse at your feet. But the wisdom of God will lead you into fullness and freedom and liberty and inward peace in the midst of the pressures and the dangers of life. Now that's the message of this book of Ecclesiastes as it is the message of the whole Bible. And in the section we come to this morning, chapter 9, verse 11, the searcher tells us the first and probably most difficult lesson of all to learn. And that is that natural gifts are not enough to handle life with. Natural abilities, great diligent effort, will not lead us into truly successful living. Look at verse 11. Again I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to the men of skill. But time and chance happen to them all, for man does not know his time. Like fish which are taken in an evil net, and like birds which are caught in a snare, So the sons of men are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. Many of us have had the experience that confirms this, where all our carefully laid plans have fallen apart. All our efforts and anticipations that we had what it took to succeed in some particular area of life all crumbled, and we couldn't understand why. But we had to learn, as this text says, the battle is not always to the strong, nor the race to the swift. That's true even in athletics. You probably all have heard of the story of the famous Indian athlete Jim Thorpe, who in the early part of this century won tremendous 
honors and many gold medals at the Olympic Games and stood before the King of Sweden and was publicly acknowledged as the greatest living athlete of his time. And yet all those medals, all those honors had to be given back when it was learned that when he was just a boy he had played uh, professional baseball, five dollars a, uh, a season. But uh, that rendered him no longer an amateur and he had to give it all back. It's not always that the strong and the mighty and the able and the gifted win in the race of politics. We've all had recent uh, experience of seeing how men that everyone thought was had, it, had a cinch on an office were defeated, were unable to fulfill their dreams. The battle's not always to the strong. Uh, the, though many have sought the awards and prizes of men, many have sought the Nobel Prize. It's given to a little woman over in India who no one knows about, who has ministered fully to the needs of the people around, Mother Teresa. Even though uh, Hollywood does its best to impress the American public, the picture that wins first prize is the best picture of 1982 is Chariots of Fire about a, a Christian athlete. And uh, the Koheleth warns us, tells us plainly, natural gifts are never enough. It's other factors that make the difference. And he tells us what they are. Time and chance, he said, happen to them all. Now what does he mean by that? Time and chance. Well, basically, it's what we often say ourselves. You have to be the right man at the right place at the right time. In other words, there's an element of, of uh, rightness that has to fall together before all the abilities that someone may have can, uh, can accomplish their desire. What he's saying, of course, is life is not in our control. That's the illusion that secular media presses upon us all the time, that it's by our choices we can handle all our life. It's your life. You can live it the way you please, the television commercials tell us. And uh, Koheleth says it can't be done that way. Time and chance happen to all. Just when you think you've got something in the bag, it can all fall apart. And yet, there's a true wisdom, he says, that can turn disaster into victory. Disasters come uh, when we least expect them. Like fish which are taken in an evil net, like birds that are caught in a snare, Everything can fall apart, and every one of us has had some experience, large or small, in that regard. But his point is, there's a wisdom which can handle that, and even though disaster may strike, it can somehow turn it into victory. And he has an example to give us on this. Verse 13, I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. Sounds like Tevye, doesn't it? In the Fiddler on the Roof. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heeded. There's no record in scripture elsewhere of this event. Evidently, Solomon perhaps has heard about this from some of the other countries that he was in close touch with. He was the greatest king of the, of the world of his day. And uh, he had many delegations that came and recounted many tales, and perhaps this is one of them. It may be that he is 
slightly confused about a story that did happen probably when he was a boy recorded in 2 Samuel, the 20th chapter, where King David sent his general Joab to capture a rebel, a traitor named Sheba, who had taken refuge in a small city up in northern Israel. And Joab came and and uh, set his army around the city and built siege works against it and was ready to knock down the walls and capture the city when a wise woman called out to him from the walls and suggested that uh, they, uh, the leaders of the city take the traitor in hand and throw his head out to Joab instead. And they did that, and by that means they saved the city. And Perhaps that's what... Solomon is reminding us here. But there's a wisdom, you, you see, that can turn what looks like sure defeat into victory. A wisdom which may not even be remembered or be widely and popularly uh, rejected. That's what verse 16 implies. I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised. And his words are not heeded. This suggests that there is a wisdom from God which will not be popular, often forgotten, often goes unheeded. But popular rejection is no sign that it's wrong or ineffective. I think this is one of the great things we have to remember today. The world is never going to applaud the basic uh, truth of Christian faith because it judges the world. It points out its error. It exposes its illusions. It humbles it. And that's what the world cannot take. So we can expect that the wisdom that we're learning from God will not make us necessarily popular. How beautifully that was expressed to us in this drama that these, this group acted out for us this morning. But it is nevertheless that which can deliver, that which can free. I want to share with you uh, a, a paragraph that I copied off the full page ad that the Jews for Jesus run in various metropolitan newspapers, headed with the words in big letters, Yeshua, Jesus. And one of, uh, it describes their work, and in it is this paragraph. God promised a Messiah, a deliverer, a problem solver. And if there's anything more difficult than the fact of sin, it's the idea that God solves our problems. But he can. He can make us want peace. He can give us hearts to care about one another, relieve guilt, Men broken homes give meaning to our lives and diminish the din of the 20th century with the music of his love. That's exactly eloquently expressing what this text and all the scripture is saying to us. Now what is this wisdom? All through this book we've been looking at wisdom versus foolishness. And in this section we have this morning, there's a great contrast to be drawn between wisdom and foolishness. What does the Bible mean when it uses those terms? I think it ought to be clear to us now that uh, wisdom is acting upon the revelation of reality which the scriptures give us. Yep. It refers to actions that are controlled by the revelation of God. What Paul calls in Romans 12, the renewed mind. Remember in the 12th chapter how he says, be not conformed to this world. Don't run after all the elusive dreams that look so uh, attractive that the world shouts at you all the time. But, be transformed. How? By the renewing of the mind. See? Think Christianly about life. Begin to look at what you're going through. 
not from the standpoint of what seems right. The scriptures warn about that. But upon what is right, according to the word of God. That's what the Proverbs says, doesn't it? That we all have memorized. Proverbs 3, 4, and 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all his ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. Now that's wisdom. The opposite, of course, is foolishness. It's the, it's the uh, adapting of the secular mind, the spirit of the age around us, of running after the advice of those who are devoid of insight from Scripture and the Word of God, following that. I want to uh, go on into this paragraph with you because there follows a tremendous contrast between wisdom and foolishness. But before I do, I would like to uh, illustrate it on a very pragmatic level that concerns us all this morning. This last week, our elders and, and pastors learned as we talk together about some of the counseling matters that we were going through, we learned there are at least 23 couples here at Peninsula Bible Church that are contemplating or actually involved in divorce. Now, we don't know their names. I don't know their names. We didn't talk about names. We just talked about facts. And as I talked to you this morning, there are probably some of you here and I don't know who you are, so I'm not talking to any person or aiming this at anyone. But I want to express a deep concern of the elders and pastors of this congregation for that situation. Because I think it represents a running after the spirit of the age, the wisdom of the world, rather than a following through of the wisdom of God. I think we need to understand clearly but Koheleth has warned us about himself. You remember back in chapter 5, he says, When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. Every couple has taken a sacred vow before God and witness that they will stay together for better or for worse until death shall part them. And that's the wisdom of God. That's what preserves a society. And if anything is going to arrest the, the uh, fragmentation of life that we see around us and the, the breakdown of morals and all the other terrible things that are happening in our day, it's got to come from Christians who will stand against the spirit of the age, who will refuse to go along with what is being suggested on every side. Kohelet says, pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin and do not say before the, the messenger, the representative of God, that it was a mistake. This is what many are saying today. Oh, I made a mistake. And... Uh, Kohelet says, why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? That isn't meant to paint God as a killjoy to life or as a, a heartless avenger visiting judgment upon people. It rather remembers that God has set the rules of life and he doesn't change them. He, to forgive us doesn't mean that he relinquishes the penalty for our misdeeds. It means he goes through it with us and strengthens us in the midst of it. But the agony and the hurt and all is there. Now I want to express the deep sense of sympathy that I personally have and all the pastors and elders here with couples that are struggling with their marriage. It's not uh, uncommon at all. Almost everybody that's ever been married very long has gone through much pain and hurt and struggle. 
I remember the early years of my own marriage and how hopeless it looked at times, how difficult it was to relate to one another, how easy it seemed to walk away and forget the whole thing, start over again. But you see, that's why marriage vows are there. It's in order to help us face up to a situation that will result in tremendous learning processes about ourselves. The problem with every marriage that's threatened are the people that are in it, both of them. They need to know something about themselves, and that's what we've been seeing from the scriptures. We don't know. We're mysteries to ourselves. And, and conflict in marriage is a way of helping us work through those and discover things that we're contributing to every situation. And to flee from that is to flee into another set of problems and hurts and pains that are usually worse than the ones you're trying to run from. Many people testify that divorce, that they thought was such an easy way out and so simple a solution to a mistake that they thought they'd made, has only introduced them into a more painful and hurtful situation than they ever had, and one that continues the rest of their lives in many ways. So my counsel to such who are struggling with that is call off the legal dog and seek counsel and help from those who are ready and available to help you guide your way through that time, guide you through that time. And look to the Lord, look to your God for help, for solving the problems of life. That's what he came for, to give us hearts to care about one another and relieve our guilt and mend our broken homes. This is what this is all about. Now with that situation in mind, look with me at this passage that follows. We have a great contrast beginning with verse 17 of chapter 9. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. That's simply saying that uh, the insights of Scripture heard in the inner voice quietly before God alone are more effective to solve problems than uh, worldly rhetoric or propaganda, some prominent opinion maker speaking out through the media, saying things that uh, are, are popularly received but are contrary to Scripture. The rulers in Scripture are not always governors or kings. They're opinion makers. They're the shapers of the minds of men. And yet uh, what they say is often only uh, what the, the foolish people around them want to hear. Bombast. Empty of meaning. And this text says that the words of the wise, the words of wisdom, heard in quiet, are much more effective than those empty propaganda lies. Then he goes on. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. But one sinner destroys much good. And he gives an example. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off an evil odor. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. This is true, of course, in the actual battles of, that nations have fought at times. Oftentimes, uh, quiet Biblical principles have, have uh, overcome the power of force. Look at the civil rights movement under Dr. Martin Luther King, who though he may have had uh, a somewhat incomplete knowledge of scripture, yet was basing his actions and his leadership upon scriptural principles of nonviolent protest. And uh, we've had vivid example of how powerful that was to overcome injustice and outright uh, physical abuse and violent attack and set things right. 
This is true in an individual or couple's life as well. Wisdom is better than war, better than fighting. But, as the warning is included here, one sinner is like a dead fly in the, in the uh, perfumer's ointment, can give off a very bad odor. One person insisting on doing it in some worldly way, following a, uh, the world's philosophy, can destroy and harm and arrest and delay the healing work of wisdom, often very much. And then Kohelet says that wisdom is a, a wise man's heart inclines him toward the right, but a fool's heart toward the left. That ought to be the motto of the Republican Party. I don't understand why it isn't. But as he says, even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. What is he saying here? Well, wisdom, God's insights, provide a safer guidance through life than the impulsive actions of those who are following the popular views around them. Even when a fool does take the right course, his, uh, he makes it clear that he doesn't understand why, and he reveals his ignorance even when he talks. I remember Dr. Lewis Ferry Chafer used to tell us at Dallas Seminary, it's much better to keep silent and let everybody think you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> and that's what Kohelet is saying here. Even when they, when, when they take the right course and do the right thing, the way they may explain it or describe it reveals how wrong they were. I remember hearing of a man who jumped in to save another man who was drowning. And when some people asked him why he did it, he said, I had to, he had my watch on. <laughs> and so even when a fool uh, walks on the road, he lacks sense, and says to everyone that he is a fool. And then uh, a fourth contrast, uh, wisdom is better than running away. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for deference will make amends for great offenses. There are occasions when it looks like running, getting out of it, looks like the best way. But this text warns us that it isn't. It's much wiser to give a soft answer that turns away wrath or to show deference to the individual involved who may be offended. And in this case, even, uh, even a ruler, even a king can be placated by by deference. Deference means acknowledging another person's feelings and rights instead of your own. And even a king can be placated in his time of anger by such a course. Then in verses 5 through 7 you have the opposite of this, the hurt that foolish thinking can cause. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as it were, an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses, and princes walking on foot like slaves. This, says the searcher, is an error that people in authority often make. And what is it? They appoint their friends to office when they're perfectly incompetent for the work. That's what he said. Put the wrong people in the right place. People who have no ability are exalted and put in high places, and those with great ability are, are treated like slaves and have no opportunity. Favoritism. There happens to be an article in this last issue of Time magazine about how 
political appointments have diminished the authority and prestige of the Supreme Court of the state of California. This very thing that he's talking about here. Then in the next section, verses 8 through uh, 11, he returns to wisdom to describe the kind of insights that wisdom will embrace. First, there's a section on avoiding dangers, understanding that certain situations have inherent dangers. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. Now, very few of us are ever going to be involved extensively in digging pits and breaking down walls and, and quarrying stones and splitting logs. Perhaps some of us will. But he's not just talking about the actual physical situation. These are descriptive, symbolic of of the kind of things we do to each other as well. Do you ever dig a pit for somebody? Lay a trap for them to embarrass them, to make them look bad? Deliberately do something that would uh, hurt them or injure them in some way? And find that you yourself were trapped by the same situation you had designed for them. That ever happened? Well, that's what he's talking about. Wisdom understands that when you dig a pit, you're in danger too. It can all fall apart on you and you be, you fall into it. Wisdom understands that when you try to break down some wall of, of obstruction to keep you from uh, getting at someone or something that you want, you're in danger that hidden in that wall is a serpent that can bite you instead. And many a person has discovered that, that in trying to heavy-handedly break down somebody's resistance, they have uh, triggered a, a serpent within themselves that uh, flashes up in anger and says terrible, hurtful, dangerous things, and they themselves have been bitten by that situation. This is what he's talking about. He who quarries stones, that's an attempt to remove something of value, to dig out something for yourself that will be of, of great use and profit in your life. But you have to remember that you can be hurt by that. You may get what you want, and it will be the worst thing that will happen to you. God teaches us that. You remember one of the Psalms says about the Israelites in the wilderness, he gave them their request, but he sent leanness into their soul. And he who splits logs can be endangered by them. The same principle. The idea that care must be exercised in all these attempts to do things that uh, may endanger you as well. And then there are two verses on how wisdom enlists help in time. If the iron is blunt and one does not wet the edge, he must put forth more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. You see, if you don't uh, think through what you're going to do, sharpen the edge of, of your approaches and, and uh, think carefully through how you're going to go about something, you'll only expend an awful lot of effort and find yourself worn out by the process. But the wise man, understanding the need for Sharpness and clearness and clar uh, clarity will whet the edge of his thought before he attempts something and thus uh, succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there's no advantage in a charmer. <laughs> the damage is already done. Don't go seeking counsel then or help to remedy a situation after it's all done. Go for help before. It's needed. Seek out counsel and the one who can charm the situation, calm the serpent that's within all of us before you get into trouble. This is what he's saying. That's the point of wisdom. And then 
we'll close this morning with the section from verses 12 to 15 where he sets forth uh, the results of foolish think talking. The dangers of foolish talking. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him, destroy him. When we, uh, without thinking, follow after the secular wisdom around us, uh, it looks good, it feels right, this is the way we're all made. But nevertheless, it's foolishness and will end up hurting ourselves. How tragically this has been illustrated many, many times in the lives of those who fling overboard all the wisdom of the word and run after the situation according to the mind of the world and end up broken, hurting, wretched, miserable, defiled, debauched, empty, lonely, it's all around us. All that we see around us increasing of the misery and, and anguish of life is due to a deliberate turning away from the wisdom of the mind of God. And it consumes, destroys one. Furthermore, it escalates. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, but the end of his talk is wicked madness. Just read the papers tomorrow morning and you'll see evidences and illustrations of that. People who started out just trying to uh, to uh, express themselves in some simple way and it escalates and builds up until they resort to violence and attack on one another and even murder and damage. Because this is the power of foolishness. 14. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? One of the marks of, the, of foolish wisdom is the effusiveness of it. This talking, just saying things for the sake of being heard. I'm reminded of the man who, who said, my wife, all she do, ever does is talk, talk, talk. And his friend said, well, what, what does she talk about? He says, I don't know. She don't say. <laughs> Empty of content. This is the characteristic of the times. Never was a day in which we are, we're so bombarded with so many words, so much literature, so much pouring out around us through the media on every side, and yet so much of it just thoroughly empty and unsatisfying and misleading in the extreme. And so he closes the section, the toil of a fool wearies him so that he does not know the way to the city. Isn't that revealing? He doesn't know the way to San Jose. <laughs> doesn't know how to go. Confused, weary, empty. So much of what we're hearing today leaves you like that, doesn't it? You uh, run after these things and you find it's not, it doesn't fulfill you. You don't feel strengthened. You spend hours listening to the television or reading magazines or novels or whatever. And you don't end up fed, satisfied, strengthened, helped. But you feel empty, lonely depressed, and more than that, worse than that, confused. How many are saying, I don't know what to do about this problem. I don't know what to take. But the scriptures tell us that in every situation where we're looking for guidance, there is a step to take, something you can do that's right. And if you do the right, another step will open, and then another. And soon you'll find there's a divine hand leading you and guiding you through the very situation step by step. And instead of breaking up and ruining and damaging all that God has been doing, gradually it begins to unfold and come to light. And, and there comes a sense of joy and satisfaction that God has worked out the problem. Now I've set this deliberately in the context of applying it to marriage. 
It applies to many other situations. But I want you to know, you who are struggling with your marriages, that the congregation understands and we sympathize and we know it's difficult, but you're making a sad and sorry mistake if you resort to divorce. That's the world's way out.